and welcome once again to Father Spitzer's Universe at the busy intersection of faith and reason. I'm Doug Keck, your guide. Your email questions are very important to us. They drive the program, Spitzer's Universe at EW10.com. Check out all of Father Spitzer's websites. There are too many to be named, but three of them are MagisCenter.com, CredibleCatholic.com, and PurposefulUniverse.com. That's PurposefulUniverse.com. Say that three times quickly. And be sure to check out the EWTN On Demand page and the EWTN YouTube channel where you will find Father Spitzer's Universe and all of our other great programs on EWTN, all our live shows, 24 hours a day. You can listen to them on podcasts, audio, watch them on demand on video. We're, we're very high tech here at EWTN thanks to Mother Angelica's vision for the network. Today our topic, what are the causes of possession and why does God allow it? from Father's book, Christ vs. Satan in Our Daily Lives, available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. And of course, the book of the month for February, in addition to Father's great works, is Spiritual Excellence, The Path to Happiness, Holiness, and Heaven by Deacon Richard Eason, who was on not too long ago with uh, Father Mitch and be on bookmark as well. And of course, with that said, we turn to the one and only Father Spitzer out of the West Coast. Welcome, Father. Great to see you again. Great to be with you too, Doug. So if you'd like to kick us off, as always, with a prayer, that'd be great. Absolutely. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for all the blessings you give us, the blessing especially of this ministry and all who participate in it. We ask you to send your Holy Spirit down upon us now, Doug, myself, our whole audience this day, so that everything we do and say will be brought to fruition in your will for the good of your church, your people, and your kingdom. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, amen. amen. And Mary, seat, seat of wisdom, pray amen. for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Well, it's great to see you again there, Father, and be with you. Uh, we just taped uh, an episode, a couple episodes of the new, all new Catholic Sphere uh, yeah. with yourself and uh, Father Chris Alar and, and Colin Donovan, that will be airing mm -hmm. in March, so people can look forward to that. And it's interesting, the reason I brought that up, because one of our our topics was where have all the Catholic gone, yeah. gone and uh, here's a, a study that just came out. It's kind of interesting. It runs a little uh -huh. counter, but let's talk about it. Good. It's a new set of numbers that came out uh, that actually the Catholic Church grew by 16 million new members in 2020, okay, uh, which basically, mm -hmm. you know, it keeps pace with kind of global population. Mm -hmm. uh, and this report goes on. The reality is that on a global level, Catholicism enjoyed the greatest expansion in its history over the past century, believe it or not, tripling from 267 million in 1900 to 1.045 billion in 2000 mm -hmm. and 1.36 billion today. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, Catholics today present, represent 17.7 percent of everyone on earth. Okay, They mentioned mm -hmm. that the Catholic population, and this I think is something we kind of know, uh, grew in Africa and Asia by 2.1 percent in Africa and 1.8 percent in Asia. Africa alone, this is amazing, mm -hmm. has shot up from 1.9 million in 1900 to 130 million in 2000 and an estimated today of 236 million. So in many ways, as this report mentions, it's becoming almost a, a non-Western religion. So when we say, where have all the Catholics yeah. gone, a lot of times we're, we're thinking about uh, North America or we're thinking about Western Europe, but in many other places it's growing. Oh yes, in fact, um, no question about that. In fact, the Catholic Church, as you just pointed out rightly, uh, in Africa, that's our best uh, area um, of not only growth, but also growth in vocations. And it is uh, truly amazing uh, how, you know, just educationally and how fervent and evangelistic, you know, the, uh, the African uh, Church is. Also, um, Asia, the Asian Church is also growing very rapidly, as you pointed out. And the Latin American Church is certainly holding its own uh, very well as, as well. Well, so uh, you're, you're right, it's becoming, uh, in a sense, a non-Western church. Uh, Western Europe and the U.S., Canada uh, are in decline. Uh, but um, if you really think about that, though, it, with immigration uh, being what it is, mm -hmm. and, of course, um, you know, um, our influence in the world 
uh, and the world's influence on us, mm -hmm. I think that is partially mitigate, mitigated in the, in the United States. And it's also partially mitigated in Europe mm -hmm. uh, because of the flow of uh, African Catholics um, and uh, Eastern European Catholics uh, into the Western European countries. Let so, um, uh, yeah, so there's, uh, right. there's a little balance uh, going on there. Let me ask you a question because we talk about that, and, and you focus a lot on young people and, and the evidence mm -hmm. and why young people aren't going to church, mm -hmm. but we've also had a fair amount of people who were not young people, but middle-aged people and seniors mm -hmm. who drifted away from the church as well, mm -hmm. uh, especially here, mm -hmm. let's say, in the United States, and sometimes we say, well, they're being replaced and filled in by people who are immigrants, which is mm -hmm. great, yeah. but, you know, what mm -hmm. happened to the others who used to be here in these seats and in these parishes mm -hmm. before? Why do you think, besides the young people, uh, issues that you focus on so much that so many of the older people just decided to drift away. Yeah, I think, you know, always and ever the evidence problem is there because the secular society pushes that, but that's not the real problem. The real problem with the middle-aged uh, people is what I call the moral uh, problem and the acceptability of morality. Um, uh, but it it's, it's comes in a very strange package, but you've heard me say it before. It's, it's with respect to those four levels of happiness, we've got a major level two problem in this mm -hmm. culture. And uh, our young kids are very much subject to it. Uh, make no mistake about that. Uh, they definitely, with Instagram and uh, Facebook and so forth, they have been very, very inundated uh, mm -hmm. with level two, which I call ego comparative identity. Who's achieving more, who's achieving less, who's got more power, less power, more status, less status, more intelligence, less intelligence, etc. So this idea of ego comparative advantage as being the real, um, you know, meaning of life, the real ground of life, that, that myth has been bought lock, stock, and barrel by so many middle-aged Americans. Uh, so many, the, the baby boomers started it in my generation. Uh, we're, we're the ones that uh, definitely Me too. bought into. <laughs> oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, ego comparative uh, advantage. And now, of course, we have not only passed it on to our kids, but with the new technologies and social media to exacerbate it, our young kids are getting it full on too. Mm -hmm. But um, I think ego comparative uh, identity is a disaster area, and I think the challenge, you know, the 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 idea of uh, you know autonomy as being an end in itself, that mm -hmm. comes from ego comparative identity. But you combine that with the sexual revolution from the 1960s and you know here I am you know people say oh there's a Catholic Church again blaming sex for everything mm -hmm. well I'm not blaming sex unjustifiably I'm saying it, it's, it's justifiably a, a reason for why people are leaving the church well it's because the abuse when you of start it, isn't it? I mean that's really what the, yeah. it's the abuse of a good yeah. which is the always abuse the issue of it. right, right? That is absolutely the case. And so when you start practicing sexuality outside of the marital bond, as Jesus instructed us, everything goes awry. Mm -hmm. In this new book I have coming out now in the fall, uh, as I understand it, um, uh, called The Moral Wisdom of the Catholic Church, that book, um, uh, it definitely says in no uncertain terms that you get an increase in depression, an increase in anxiety, all these things are increasing but people are just so you know hooked in as it were to this culture um, mm -hmm. that they uh, they basically they can't almost break themselves from the pornography addictions they can't break themselves from the uh, sexual li uh, um, uh, license that's kind of been out there that the internet makes so uh, available and it's really doing r dark things I mean talk about an introduction of evil I know we're gonna get into this a little mm -hmm. later in the book but but I mean uh, you know it's a portal for Satan to just come ra rampant through because there's almost this whole area of disobedience to God it's this whole area of rebelling against God it's this whole area of no one is gonna deprive me of getting the sexual gratification I want even though it has nothing to do with God's commandment even though it has nothing to do with the commitment to anybody else even though it has nothing to do with self-sacrificial covenant love even though it has nothing to do with children mm -hmm. even though it has nothing to do with everything that God intended it to have to do with you know I'm just gonna 
do what I want. And that's where the portal comes in. That's where the evil comes rushing through is in that rebellion aspect to it. And of course there's an addiction aspect to it that once people get hooked and addicted, they can't break the addiction. But still, that there's that access. I mean, evil gets that access through the portal of rebellion. And, and um, uh, you know, it's done a lot to our culture. But the, the really interesting study was this group of guys, uh, sociologists at the University of Oklahoma, went ahead and did this study and correlated uh, religious practice with pornography. And the greater the pornography watching that's going on, right, the so-called victimless sin, mm -hmm. well, guess what? You also see a decrease in religious practice across the board. Decreased religious, um, you know, Bible reading, decreased prayer, decreased church attendance, whatever church you go to, et cetera, mm -hmm. across the board. And the greater, more time you're spending with pornography, the less time you're spending with religion. Almost a, a complete inverse correlation. Mm -hmm. So this, for the first part, but what's I mean, interesting I'm not with, surprised. But what's interesting mm -hmm. with that is a lot of time uh, media likes to portray it the other way. It's the, it's the hung up uh, person who's very church oh, yeah. oriented and very pious, but they're really addicted to pornography. Yeah, well, actually, it's quite the opposite. You know, now, now some people, of course, are practicing right. their religion. They're addicted to pornography, but they're trying to break the addiction. They're trying to go to confession. They're trying their best to stay within the bounds of Christ's own teaching on this because Christ is the true doctor of the soul. He knows what um, this stuff can do to us and, and so uh, uh, how highly addictive it is and how it just breaks up marriages your marriage you know once you go in the pornography route the marriage uh, breakups you know go skyrocketing mm -hmm. it's more than double the divorce rate simply because there's no emotional intimacy left in the marriage literally pornography addiction takes over emotional intimacy and the capacity for self-sacrifice uh for you know within the marriage and the children notice it they don't know it's from pornography mm -hmm. they just notice you know dad's not with it he doesn't really care about us or whatever the case may be. And by the way, women are also now getting addicted right. uh, to pornography. So the idea that you know these are victimless sins is not victimless at all. But if you're asking me why are the Middle Agers leaving, number one reason, ego comparative mm -hmm. identity. That's what's made freedom an end in itself. Mm -hmm. um, the second reason is because I think that sexual revolution uh, aspect, the idea of sex being a victimless sin or, you know, this is two consenting adults, all these ways of rationalizing it, mm -hmm. embedded in that is the irresponsibility embedded in sexuality when God intended it to be the most responsible, self-sacrificial, commitment-oriented for the family um, idea was, was you know, embedded in it by God. And the breaking of that natural embedding of these two um, you know, uh, dimensions of, of sexuality, that breaking is what is causing uh, people not only to be in rebellion, but giving the evil spirit this kind of portal to just, you know, kill religious sentiment. Mm -hmm. And I think that that pornography study of the Oklahoma professors, that's the one you, you there's the clue as to what this stuff does to religion. And I think you combine the sex with the freedom and all of a sudden right. you go, oh, ho, there's one big, massive narcissistic influence. Because what's always in the middle of narcissism? the autonomous freedom philosophy and sex. Let's face it, unmitigated, unmoored, uncommitted sex. There's, it's always there and narcissism, you know, is the kind of the net result of the whole darn thing. Mm -hmm. And you look at that and what's, the, you just take a look at religion versus narcissism. Wherever religion is strong, narcissism is weak. Wherever narcissism is strong, religion is weak. Mm -hmm. So, you know, all these patterns make sense. So, you know, the culture of narcissism, as the Marxist, the former Marxist, Christopher Lash used to call it, mm -hmm. right? The culture of narcissism is anti-religious. It's the anti-Christ 
uh, and boy, with now with the internet um, mm -hmm. delivering this stuff, now with all the unmitigated freedom stuff that's everywhere present in the culture, I'm me and nobody can tell me what to do. I have my own agenda and who are you anyway uh, mm -hmm. to give me any orders? And of course, some God giving me a moral instruction. Um, I'm responsible to a moral agency outside of myself. I'm going to be just like thus spake Zarathustra. <laughs> I'm just going to go and kill God uh, for myself so that I can do whatever I want and be responsible to no one but myself. I'll be the, uh, you know, Ubermenschlichkeit. I'll be the Superman essence, you know, that will, uh, you know, dominate the world. Ha! Look at where Nietzsche wound up with all that nonsense in a padded cell screaming in his insanity. So the right. point, of course, that uh, I point out is, yes, right. we can all see there's a correlation. The autonomous freedom, the sexuality unmoored from commitment makes for the narcissistic culture. The narcissistic culture kills religion and, relig and with the killing of religion comes an increase in depression, an increase in anxiety, increase in suicidal ideation, substance abuse, familial tensions, and everything that's killing us culturally today. If we could just put Christ back right. in the center, we can get over this horrible cultural condition, which is, it's written so, it's right. written large everywhere in, in the sociological statistics of secular organizations, universities, you know, the archives mm -hmm. of, of, um, of uh, general right. psychiatry, etc. But it's all there. All we got to do is look at it, and that's why I wrote this book, The Moral Wisdom of the Catholic Church. I just couldn't stand the truth being <laughs> hidden anymore by our right. wonderful media. Right. It's there, but it's not the studies you hear about. It's interesting, yeah, too, because there, right. was, there was a... Uh, a recent survey that I saw, and it, and what they pointed out was interesting. And they said, "What is the most, the happiest young women?" And I think it was women like 30 to 40, let's say. Uh -huh. It was something like that. But it was it was middle age, younger women, and and the happiest young youngest women came back were married. The yeah the the group that was the unhappiest younger women mm -hmm. were living with somebody. Exactly. The people who were oh, single yeah. and dating had, had, were happier than those living with somebody. But the happiest group was the woman who was married. That is absolutely true, and I've got also the statistics to show that because the, of the stress levels in cohabitation, mm -hmm. they're much higher. The, the use of substances, uh, you know, illegal substances or legal, now legal substances right. uh, in, in cohabitation is much more increased than in marriages. And of course, you always have the reassurance of the public commitment in the marriage that you never have in the cohabit cohabitating relationship. Mm -hmm. And then you get to the gender asymmetry problem, right? Is that the normally the woman partner wants to move toward marriage, the m male partner wants to kind of delay the marriage and then you've got these asymmetrical mm -hmm. interests which shoot up the stress level in the cohabitation relationship and by the way not um, uh, you know just to you know parallel it with everything we we're saying before what happens in cohabitation relationships religion declines what happens in cohabitation relationships? Substance abuse increases. Stress levels, depression levels, anxiety levels are increasing. Then you take a look at what happens with marriage. In ma good marriages, religious uh, commitment increases, and good religious commitment actually, reciprocal causation, actually strengthens a good marriage. So you've got religion and marriage are like together. What did uh, Father Peyton say? Um, the, the, the couple that prays together Get stays together. Right. So right. utterly reciprocally causative truth uh, is, is said in that one statement. And not Sorry. surprisingly, in that same study, yeah. the men who are the most satisfied in that group were uh, not married. They were living with somebody. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. So there oh, yeah. is a they, difference yeah. between men the, and women's perspective on those things. Let's get to some uh, questions that recently came into us. Uh, Dear mm -hmm. Father Spitzer, on a recent show, you said Jesus became aware of his divinity early in life because, among other reasons, Mary and Joseph were there to talk to him about his origin. In Luke mm -hmm. chapter 2, Jesus asked Mary, did you not know that I would be in my father's house? Luke continues, but they did not understand mm -hmm. 
what he said to them. Does this imply that while they obviously understood his divine origin, were they still working out the fact that he was the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity? And this is from James. Well, James, I don't think probably Mary and Joseph were thinking in those terms, right? Because right. uh, those are highly technical Greek theological terms mm -hmm. um, that they probably were not thinking along the lines of. Um, but did they know that Jesus was of divine origin? Yes, they did. That uh, Did they know somehow that he was the son uh, of God, his father? Yes, they knew. And, and certainly Joseph was aware of being foster father uh, of Jesus, not the real uh, father of Jesus um, because of the... Um, uh, you know, the, the work, the power of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. working through Mary uh, made, of course, Jesus uh, to be incarnate um, in his identity, um, you know, uh, in the womb. He does not have a, a true a human father. He had just a foster father. Did they know that? Of course they know. How could they not know that? Mm -hmm. I mean, so that's that part of the formula is definitely true. Jesus himself, of course, not only has uh, awareness of what Mary and Joseph have told him, but also, remember, has the interior awareness, right? That, that strong intuition, which I compared to, like, think of how you, when you were a little kid, had an intuition of God, an intuition of God's presence. An intuition of God's goodness, an intuition of the goodness of sacredness at church, and in, you know, a natural kind of kid-like piety, etc. Yes, of course, I was mischievous in church, you know, when my brother was poking me or something like that. However, on the other hand, uh, you know, I did have a natural piety, a natural mm -hmm. awareness of sacredness. I did have a natural awareness of God's presence, etc. Now, think of this like like a trillion times more in Jesus. Mm -hmm. That natural intuition that you have, he's got it, you know, like a million billion times more. Now, so if you think of it along those lines, yeah, it, intuitively, Jesus knows he's of divine origin. He doesn't yet have the words, the human words, uh, to put on it until he's learned human words mm -hmm. or the concepts that we would use in our human nature uh, to attach to those words. He doesn't quite have that uh, until he gets a little older. But does he have the intuition of being his father's son? Absolutely. Divine father's son? Absolutely. Does he have the intuition of divine origin? Does he have the intuition? that he is equal to the Holy of Holies? Yes, he does. Interiorly, he does. His relationship with God, even as a child, is so intimate, it's mm -hmm. just overwhelming. And then, of course, with Mary and Joseph uh, bringing some explanation to uh, that in, world, in our, you know, this mm -hmm. world incarnate terms, he definitely gets even greater insight. But as a child, he's already, you know, He's already going after the, 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 the scrolls. He's already uh, going after the scriptures. He's not just hanging around and listening to a, some summary version of the law. And that's why I mm -hmm. think in the Lucan, you know, which I consider to be kind of a Marian testimony mm -hmm. uh, to the story of Jesus' youth, I think that, uh, that Luke uh, properly, uh, you know, has him there in the temple portraying this because Jesus wanted to know. Mm -hmm. He wants to be with these experts. He wants to get, uh, you know, the full story to fill in what he already intuitively knows, what he knows from his father. He's just trying to get the theological, conceptual expertise, as it were, to fill in what is already self-evidently and immediately, um, uh, you know, intuitively right. uh, uh, what he's aware of uh, in, in his soul. And so they're that's, clearly that's, impressed uh, by what he knows. I mean, obviously. Yes, oh yeah. So. Oh, I mean, he's blowing them away. Mm -hmm. And that's the whole point is like, who are you? I mean, it's like, uh, what do you have, some special access? And here's this guy mm -hmm. coming onto the scene without any theological uh, education. He can't point to any rabbinical school. He's got no rabbinical pe uh, pedigree. And what do the Pharisees call him? Rabbi. Mm -hmm. I love it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like, uh, well, I don't know who you are, but you didn't go to any of the big rabbinical schools. But, boy, you know more than we do. 
-hmm. It's like, you know, today, you know, and if some guy comes, you know, here comes a kid on the scene, you know, he's a 25-year-old, and he goes, uh, let, let me just give you the answer to all these equations that That's you guys right. don't right. know of. Where'd you go to school? Uh, well, I haven't, I didn't, didn't go to MIT or, or I, I didn't, didn't go to any of those schools. That I, I didn't go to school, but here, here, here's, the, here's the answer to your equations. I kind of looked it up. And I think, up, think uh, I saw you know, that movie, uh, <laughs> yeah. Will Hunting I'll or something like that. Yeah, oh, is that right? <laughs> 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 sort of like that. Here's another question before we get to the break. Dear Father Spitzer, I'm a professor at a Catholic university. The university mm -hmm. is encouraging the use of preferred pronouns that a student wishes. As a practicing Catholic at a Catholic university, this really bothers me. My university seems to take the position that it's more loving to accept what somebody wishes to call themselves. Does addressing someone by pronouns you know to be incorrect an insult to God, a perplexed professor. Yeah, well, you know, perfect, uh, per, 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 perplexed professor. <laughs> I've got this, uh, this thought, you know, um, first of all, you have to survive in academe because we need you, a very good professor who really does believe in Jesus' teaching. We need you mm. to be there in that uh, academic environment and to help these students along. One person like you just turns hundreds of heads every year. So the first thing is survive. If this issue is at such a bloated level, you know, you, you know how you can kind of do what you have to do without doing one, you know, millimeter more, mm -hmm. you know, and so the, the first thing is, is, you know, please don't jeopardize your job, uh, you know, over uh, pronouns. That's the first thing. The second thing is, is you know, if somebody, uh, you know, if if you want to do something, you know, about you know the proton, a pronoun issue. Mm -hmm. pro I was just talking about proton radiation. Sorry, mm -hmm. uh, but about the pronoun issue, uh, the the first thing that you probably want to do is do it in a forum where you can explain your position, mm -hmm. and just say, you know, I really do believe that the science is correct. There is no uh, genetic operators involved in a man being trapped in a woman's body, a woman being trapped in a man's body. Uh, the idea of having, you know, um, you know a, a gender opposite of what your biological sex is. So there's no genetic uh, evidence for this at all. So there's something you can just explain. There's something that's going on uh, in the brain. There's something that's going on in the mind where a person believes this. And then you can sort of uh, begin to uh, trace mm -hmm. some of the roots for where gender confusion comes in uh, before adolescence or do something of that nature where you can actually educate people. But, you know, it's the old, uh, you know, Jesuit adage, a never deny, seldom affirm, always distinguish. Mm -hmm. The idea is you don't want to really take the issue on the pronoun level because all you, you wind up doing is shouting at each other and nothing's ever going to uh, get anything uh, going. So I wouldn't make the issue the stand there. Always go to the higher level where you can make adequate distinctions. In other words, always kind of try and get up to higher level discourse. So what is the cause of, you know, this gender confusion? Um, you know, uh, even, uh, you know, a, a dissymmetry of, of sorts. What is the cause of uh, this going on in a person's life? Okay, so maybe there was 60% of the time there's sexual abuse, physical abuse hmm. in the family. Uh, about 80% of the time there's extreme anxiety level on the part of one or more of the parents, generally of the parent opposite gender of the person who's having the gender confusion. So that would be a, a you know, second major area. Third major area, of course, is the whole idea of parents expressing dissatisfaction to the child for just being the child they are. So they want to dress the boy up in girls' clothes and admire them and give them a nice little girl's name and girls' toys and so forth. You know, <laughs> you can expect there's going to be some gender confusion uh, mm -hmm. one day when that kid looks at himself in the mirror and sees uh, somebody and wants to name himself a woman's name, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera. So all these things, we know that they're there 
in the background. And we know that there is an underlying anxiety that is there um, as well. And here's the moral and ethical issue. You have to treat the anxiety that underlies the physical sexual abuse. You have to treat the anxiety that underlies the little boy or the little girl's anxiety uh, that they feel because of their parents' anxiety. So the little boy is thinking, well, you know, gosh, my mom's all anxious and, and she's all, you know, aggravated because... Uh, I have done something wrong. Well, what did I do wrong? I came out a boy instead of, she wanted a girl, and that's why she's anxious. All I gotta do right. is be a girl, and she well, will be happier. Well, speaking of anxious, uh, the, uh, the director's anxious that we take a break. <laughs> so we're gonna have to ask you <laughs> to good. leave it there, and we'll be back with much more, uh, and as Father will explain on the other side of this break. Stay with us here on EW10, Father Spitzer's Universe. And we are back with part two of Father Spitzer's Universe. What are the causes of possession? Why does God allow it from Father Spitzer's Christ versus Satan in our daily lives? Available through our catalog. Of course, Father was finishing off there about the pronouns. But uh, let's move on to a couple of other questions. Uh, sure. Dear Father Spitzer, many people I talk to say they don't feel anything by going to church or praying or in receiving the Eucharist. Why does God keep this experience from them? This is Al. Al, you know, first of all, Feelings are the most built up, exaggerated, and uh, overdone uh, thing in our culture. Now, you know, of course feelings are important, you know, when you're dealing with somebody who's having severe depression or clinical depression or something of that nature, but we really just have to get over the supremacy of feelings and get back to the supremacy of ontology. It's, an, it's who you are, <clears throat> not how do you feel that matters? And so <coughs> St. Ignatius of Loyola <coughs> gives us a very good way of dealing with that. He makes a distinction between affective desolation and consolation versus <coughs> spiritual consolation and desolation. Affective consolation and desolation, as you might expect, that's the feeling of consolation, the feeling of being one with God, the feeling of being at peace. That's what you're talking about in terms of some people who are not feeling uh, consolation at mass. And there's also the feeling of desolation, anxiety, emptiness, alienation, loneliness, and dread on a kind of a spiritual cosmic level that we've talked about before on this show. Now, those are feelings. Now, let's get to the other part, though. Ignatius says that's not what really matters. What really matters is, number one, are you increasing in trust in God? Are you increasing in hope in your salvation? Are you increasing in charity? Are you increasing in your freedom to resist temptation and to become virtuous in the eyes of God? Now, if that's what you're doing, you're in real consolation, spiritual consolation. Wow, you're going, you're, you know, trust, hope, and love, and you're increasing in those, and you've got the freedom to resist temptation, you're in real consolation. Alternatively, there's what you might call spiritual desolation, mm -hmm. where you have a decrease in trust in God, hope in your salvation, love, and of course, you've got a decrease in freedom to resist temptation and to uh, appropriate virtue. Now, if that is the case, and you're in the spiritual desolation, you think to yourself, that is a bad scene, says Ignatius of Loyola, because the spirit that's influencing you is the evil did spirit. He, did he actually say bad scene? No, he didn't say that. <laughs> he was really ahead of his time, man. Yeah, no, okay. he, he just said that's a bad state of being, though. Oh, okay. He said it's because the spirit of, that's influencing you, right, is the evil spirit. Whereas if you've got spiritual consolation, the spirit that's influencing you is really the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So, of course, uh, the devil will never want to increase trust, hope, and love, and the freedom to be moral. And, of course, the um, Holy Spirit will never want to decrease mm -hmm. trust, hope, and love, okay. and the freedom to be moral. So the idea for Ignatius is that's what is important. Why do you go to church? 
You go to church not to feel good. You go to church so that you can trust in God more. Does that happen? I've got the statistics to prove it. People who go to church trusting God more. People who go to church hope in their salvation more. People who go to church are capable of charity to a greater extent. Yes, they're committed not only to God in these things, but they're committed to his morality, they're, and they have an anchor. They have a meaning anchor, right, that, that's in their lives. They have an absolute anchor for dignity. They've got an absolute context for uh, ultimate meaning in life, an ultimate and eternal salvation. They've got the context for everything. Of course they're going to be, <laughs> you go to church, mm -hmm. you, go, you think you're fulfilling God's will, you're going to hope in your salvation more, of course. And if, if you don't go to church, you're not going to have any of that sense of salvation. Of course you're on the brink of this bear, because there's nothing more than this world. There's nothing more than the here and now. Even Sark, the atheist, mm -hmm. called it nausea to be in that state. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and you really look at it, what Ignatius was saying is, you're going to church to increase your trust in God, your hope in salvation, and your your capacity for charity and for love. And what's that going to do? Eventually, if you're trying to please God, irrespective of how you're feeling, if you're trying to please God, if you're trying to please Our, our Lady, our Blessed Virgin Mary, if you're trying to please uh, the divine, uh, you know, the heavenly court, if you're trying to please them, you can be assured of this. Eventually, you will get the freedom to resist temptation more, and you'll get the freedom as well to appropriate virtue more. So you know that that's the reason to go to church. Now, sometimes, says Ignatius, you're going to church, and all of these good things are happening. The Holy Spirit's entering into your life. You're closing off the portal to Satan, right? So, you're, you know, trust, hope, and love going up you know, resistance to temptation going up. Now he says sometimes that can produce good feelings. Mm -hmm. If it does, great. If it doesn't, don't worry about it. Mm -hmm. You're still getting what you're supposed to get. Feelings, they can run counter or not counter. But let's just uh, to the to the spiritual reality. Now sometimes, of course, you, you know, people can go uh, to church and they feel nothing can happen to most people a whole lot of the time. But remember this adage, 95% of the fruit of prayer happens outside of prayer. 95% of the fruit of mass happens outside of mass. Mm -hmm. You will know the reality of Jesus' presence in the Eucharist by the effects that it's having the effects that are there that the Eucharist is having on you after Mass. Mm -hmm. So something begins to happen. Maybe you get a sense of equilibrium. Maybe you leave Mass and you just have a sense that everything is okay. Or you leave Mass and you have an almost unrecognized sense that you have a, a, an eternal meaning, an ultimate meaning. You have an eternal destiny and an ultimate destiny. You have eternal salvation, ultimate salvation. You've got all of these things. You may not even recognize it in your feelings or in your thoughts, but you're carrying the Lord's word inside of you, the Lord's presence inside of you. The Holy Spirit is awakening these things inside of you, and you go out, and what do you do? You do something charitable for someone, and you go, gee whiz, I thought I was a more narcissistic rat than this, but in point of fact, I just, it just blurped out of me. How did that happen? I, that has been my experience for years and years that all of a sudden you'll notice things. And I tell that humorous story of people that to me in college, after I started going to daily mass, they started saying things like, Spitzer, you're really changing. And I'd say, no, I'm the same narcissistic rat I've always been. And they go, mm -hmm. well, you still are, but n not as much. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the point is, you know, there's something going on. You shall know the Eucharist by its effect, by the Lord's effects in your heart. And it's uh, happening after Mass. So don't worry about the feelings. That's my thought. Right. And when the Lord wants to give you the consolation, He will. The main thing is go to Mass to learn 
how to trust more right. in God, to be in greater communion with God. Go to Mass to have that greater sense of God's purpose for your salvation. Go to Mass so you can learn how to be more charitable towards others. Go to Mass so that you can conform your will to God's will in your moral life. Right. If you, that's the reason you're going to Mass. Well, what happens with those things, too, I think a lot of times you don't realize what you've been given until, you know, things happen yeah. and you're under the stress yeah. and you have the ability to yeah. deal with it better than sometimes others who haven't been yeah. in that situation. You know, we say life is difficult enough with faith. How people get through it yeah. who don't have faith is always amazing. Here's a quick question yeah. that will take us into the book. Dear Father okay. Spitzer, I find your current discussion on possession interesting. Can Satan or lower ranking demons possess more than one person at the same time? I suspect they can't, but since they move so quickly, maybe they can. Darren. Darren, I just think they do, uh, well, of course, Satan can tr control minions, mm -hmm. and those minions can possess a lot of people at the same time. But he's the boss uh, of those uh, minions, and so in a way, he's responsible. But the possessing demon generally possesses one person at a time. Mm -hmm. That's their main purpose. Um, and sometimes it's multiple demons that possess one person mm -hmm. uh, at a time. But Satan is up there kind of responsible for everything, right? So he's in control, um, you know, of the many minions who are doing his um, work. And uh, some of those minions are very high on the demonic chain, and they can definitely, as in the case of Robbie Mannheim, uh, do a lot of damage. Mm -hmm. Okay, moving to your book, Christ versus Satan in Our Daily Lives, page 178, The Reality of Divine Goodness and Spiritual Evil. You make this point, uh, even if a person tries to do spiritual harm to another through a curse, he cannot. And this was the point that I thought was interesting in going through this book was, God will now not allow a demon to invade anyone's soul, only the body. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So in other words, your freedom will remain intact. Mm -hmm. And of course, people look at a possession victim and they go, that guy doesn't have freedom. Not, it, it, you can't see that, 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 you know, there's basically what the devil's doing is taking over the subconscious, the devil's taking over the imagination, the voice, the body, the whole thing, right? It, you know, he's doing that and, and a voice is coming out of that person. You'd say, well, that's not his voice. It isn't his voice. That is true. But what's happening at the very same time is that the person's soul has just been pushed to the recesses. That person's soul is still there. It's still free. It's still uninvaded. It's just pushed back. It can't manifest itself through the body. However, most of the time when the possessed person is not in a trance, that person is definitely um, free. So in other words, when Robbie was not, or, you know when the trance is starting, right? When the eyes roll back into the head mm -hmm. and when all the bizarre conduct starts coming, the voice changes, the temperature in the room goes down. When all that stuff is happening, mm -hmm. um, you know, okay, the person's going into a trance, but just think of that soul being just pushed back to the recesses and this other personality has come to the forefront using the voice and some of the brain of the person that's possessed. Now, you know, when the person get, comes out of the trance, there they are again. Robbie then can take catechism class. He can, uh, you mm -hmm. know, try to say the creed. Now, of course, when he tries to say the creed and make an official profession of faith, you know mm -hmm. right at that point that the devil's going to go, wait a cotton pick a minute here. Um, I'm not going to let this happen. So he gets out, throws Robbie into a trance into a fit, into this demonic voice coming, you know, to the forefront. But he hasn't gotten Robbie's soul. He hasn't taken over anything in Robbie's mm -hmm. soul. All he's done is sort right. of taken over parts of the brain, which control certain motor functions, voice, voice functions, subconscious functions, and some cerebral imaginatory, uh, right. imaginary uh, functions. Right. You also mentioned here, uh, you kind of asked the question and respond, can any good come out of oppression and possession? Uh, beyond the necessary consequence of God creating us as spiritual beings with a free will. So what could mm -hmm. good could come out of somebody having been possessed? Uh, I think three big goods. Uh, one good is what came out of Blatty writing about it in The Exorcist. Mm -hmm. and, and that was that a lot of people went, 
whoa, you know, maybe there is an evil spirit out there. And of course, people who witness some of these of this paranormal, uh, you know, you know, kinds of activity, right? They're they're looking at this preternatural activity, mm -hmm. right? They're looking at this uh, stuff and they go, uh oh, maybe there really is an evil spirit. Then they calculate, wait a minute. Uh, how do I protect myself from this evil spirit? Oh, maybe there's God out there. Oh, maybe this whole thing about the cosmic struggle between Satan and Christ, between good and evil, maybe there's something to that. Maybe I ought to go to church to protect myself from God. So first of all, I got you've got a lot of people who are looking at this, like Robbie's mm -hmm. relatives, right? They're going, whoa, man, you know, uh, Maybe I should be thinking about my religion a little bit mm -hmm. more. Maybe I ought to be thinking about obeying Christ a little bit more. Number two, one of you know, if you're witnessing a, a possession, uh, certainly uh, you suddenly know the the power of the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you ever wanted evidence of you know uh, Jesus's power. Right. If you ever, you know, you say, well, I, you know, never going to have any, you know, sense of, uh, you know, maybe healing a person or something through the name of Jesus, though that happens very often. But in the name of Jesus, I'm telling you, you say that to a possessed person and you will see the reaction. Boy, I'll tell you, it at once is just like fighting that name, you know, the the from within, right? You know, the 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 fight and the yelling and and the the pain just at at the mere mention of the name of Jesus, and then of course, you know, the use of the name of Jesus and the blood of Jesus, and as you're using that, um, you know, um, you can see that the that the evil, the power of evil is weakening. Uh, as you, you talk about the name of Jesus, you can see that the power of evil is fighting the name of Jesus. And you got to think to yourself, hey, wait a minute. Let me think about that. Why would that name be so powerful? Why would that name inspire such fighting? Why would that name have that effect on that possessed person? Right? you got to look at that and you go, Maybe there's something to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, so the person who's kind of weak in faith or something of that nature, right. you know, or somebody who, like, let's say they have really gone to the line. They're a person who's just on the verge of oppression because they've been dinking around with some kind of a, a Ouija board or some kind of tarot cards, but they really are right on the borderline of the occult, right? And they've been, uh, you know, they're there, and they all of a sudden can begin to feel within them the power of this evil that's inside of them and how manipulative it is and how it can kind of push them around and things of that nature. And you, then all of a sudden they try this prayer, in the name of Jesus be gone, Satan. And they say that about 10 times, and they really mean it, and they do say it in an imperative, a commanding way. In the name of Jesus Christ, my Lord and Savior, be gone, Satan. And all of a sudden they feel, right, that, you know, all of a sudden a lessening Mm -hmm. maybe of the pressure on their chest, or maybe a lessening of that manipulative influence on the inside, right? And they begin to feel that. You know right then and there, Jesus is in charge. Mm -hmm. The Holy Spirit is in charge. And, you know, all of a sudden that idea of Jesus, you know, well, maybe, you know, uh, I believe in God, you know, but Jesus, you know, mm -hmm. the divinity of Jesus, I'm not so sure about the divinity. Well, all you have to do is see the power of the name of Jesus in a healing or in an exorcism, right. and all of a sudden you go, ah, maybe there's something to that name, and that might get people a little bit charged up. Right. The third thing, of course, that I think is important is the victim themselves. Mm -hmm. So you look at the victim, they don't generally remember what happened to them in their trance-like states, right? And once the exorcism is completed, they, do, they have very little memory of anything at all of what's happened to them. But in the end, uh, w when people tell them 
about what happened and who was responsible, uh, you know, and how their uh, liberation uh, took place. Uh, those victims oftentimes have a complete transformative experience. And remember, when they're not in their trans-like states, they have to cooperate with God in their freedom. And so a lot of victims, uh, you know, who came to the brink of, of an ex or came mm -hmm. to the brink of a possession, maybe they were oppressed or something of that nature. Those people, because they had to use their freedom in the exorcism, they become very religious people in the aftermath. And some of them, you know, as you know, there are former Satanists who go around and talk about their right. experience and how Jesus saved them, well, how we, the Catholic Church was involved right. in their being saved. Well, I, I remember when the exorcist uh, came out in uh, December 73 mm -hmm. into 74, and you go to see it, and mm -hmm. it kind of wakes you up to, oh, wow, demonic possession. Yeah. Uh, this this stuff mm -hmm. is real. So it had that impact. Mm -hmm. On the other side, initially, as a Catholic, I was disappointed that it seemed like it took so much work to get rid of them. I just thought, well, yeah. gee, can't a priest just go in there with some holy water in Jesus' name and say, be gone, Satan? Yeah. Well, see, this, this is the problem, is the person's freedom has to be involved. All right, the person's freedom is involved in getting into the thing. Mm -hmm. The person's freedom has to be involved in getting oh, okay. out of the thing. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, you know, that's absolutely crucial is a person has to go to confession. The idea of having an exorcism and the person doesn't go to confession and the person doesn't start regularly receiving the Holy Eucharist, this is going to be a waste of time. They've got to be involved in it. They've got to get the grace through their own freedom. They've got to have that sincere repentance for sin. And they've got to have that firm purpose of amendment that's involved in, you know, whatever it is that got them into the thing. Mm -hmm. They've got to have the same freedom to get out of the thing through, of course, the grace of the sacraments, which is very powerful indeed. You know, nobody will, if you've been in the exorcism business, I'm telling you one thing, you'll never think the same thing about this, the sacramental grace of confession again, mm -hmm. because you'll know it's for real, that's wow. for sure. But also the same thing, you'll never think that Christ is not really present in the Holy Eucharist, because the effects, once again, the effect of the Holy Eucharist, you know, once a person mm -hmm. starts receiving regularly, I mean, the devil gets weaker and weaker and weaker. It takes time because your freedom has to cooperate with the grace of the Eucharist. But as you do, you'll notice that it does it does take time, but as the once Robbie actually received Holy Communion, once Robbie went to confession, once he made his profession of faith, once he did all those things, it was like a three day turnaround. Mm -hmm. Boom. On Easter Monday, the following right. month, I think it was Monday after Easter, he turned right around and uh, St. Michael ordered the right. evil spirit right out of him. I interesting weekend to have that happen, right? So, uh, uh, Yeah, as well, absolutely. Right? I mean, right. day after Easter, truly amazing. Mm -hmm. Right. And one other point here, just uh, as we're wrapping things up, to follow up on the point mm -hmm. you said about the, the soul you make the point that he will not allow evil spirits to coexist with him in his sacred place because the soul is a sacred place. And moreover, mm -hmm. evil spirits would not want to spend time in a sacred place. They'd find it quite repulsive. Oh, yeah. Well, who's present in the soul? I mean, of course, we talk about the soul in philosophy, right? We're looking at the intellective powers of the soul, the self-conscious powers of the soul, right? And, and that these intellective and self-conscious powers, you know, um, are partially what gives rise to freedom. But the other major important dimension of the soul, it is the dwelling place of our Lord in us. That part of the soul. The, the Lord is there in, that, in the soul. He's the one that's transmitting these transcendental desires to us, the horizon of perfect truth, love, goodness, beauty, and home. But more than that, He is transmitting to us this sense of holiness that we yearn for. We almost have to kind of cut ourselves off to turn off that yearning for His holiness, to turn off the invitation that He gives to us in the center of our soul. You know, St. Teresa of Avila has this great book called uh, The Interior 
superior castle. And in that book, of course, the Lord is dwelling there. And what is he doing? He's calling us into the inner mansions. But we are outside at first, of course, as St. Augustine would put it. I was, you were inside and I was looking for you outside. I wasn't even looking for you outside. I was just outside. And of course, it's that same analogy that Teresa of Avila uses. She says, okay, there's the vipers and the snakes and the various things that are out there biting us and distracting us and seducing us and so forth and so on. But as we make our way by the power of the word of Christ, by the power of the church through the sacraments, as we make our way into the interior castle, by the time we get to the third mansion, what's going on? Mm -hmm. At that juncture, now in the, in the third mansion, the call, Christ the King in our center, the holiness that's drawing us there, the wonder, the beauty, the affection, the goodness of the Lord who's drawing us ever more into the center, he now becomes, and Mary as well, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, drawing us into the center. As this is happening, uh, all of a sudden there's another kind of a drawing power that we didn't notice when we were outside there. Then you know the real power of the soul. That's what right. the devil finds very repulsive indeed. That's the dwelling place of our Lord, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. There he is in the center of our soul. And of course, as Teresa says, uh, no devil is going to want to go near there. Right. In fact, the devil really, you know, maybe he appears here and there in the fourth or fifth mansions. There's seven of them, right? Mm -hmm. And the seventh, you're kind of in with uh, the Lord. But the idea um, for St. Teresa right. is the devil is less and less. As you approach the center, he's got much less influence. Well, in we're fact, going to have by the to time uh, pull up the drawbridge for this week there, uh, <laughs> Father, in the, your interior right. castle we're talking about here. So give us your blessing on the way out the door. That'd be great, okay? <laughs> Absolutely. And bow your heads and pray for God's blessing. And may the Lord who is in your soul, the Lord who is calling you to ever and ever greater dimensions of holiness and goodness, of love and truth, call you and may you have the openness to respond to him that holiness, to find yourself in the presence of true joy and goodness in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Father Spitzer. Be well. We shall see you next week. And remember that Father Spitzer's books are available through our EWTN Religious Catalog, along with all of his wonderful videos as well. Next week, How Does Possession Take Place? We'll talk about that as we wrap up this chapter. And of course, this weekend, I did an interview on the book, The Catholic Gentleman, Living Authentic Manhood Today. The author is Sam Guzman. Check that out. And we've also got uh, Restored, Stories of Encounter, a new documentary sharing the lives of ordinary people who are using their gifts to serve the body of Christ. It's all this week at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Next week, Be Your Best, Father Cedric Pesenia shows us how, through God's grace, we can become the persons that God has created us to be. And that starts next Monday, February 21st at 5.30 p.m. Eastern. Go to EW10.com for all the information on our wonderful programming on TV, radio, and on the net. I'm Doug Keck. Join us next time for Father Spitzer's Universe. We'll see you then.